okay, where, where are you from? I'm from Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, and then do you know what she said? Oh, isn't that place in Thailand? <laughs> like, like they, they don't even, can't even differentiate like normal average Joe in America <laughs> in high school because of how the education system works. It's played a huge factor into making us less proud to be Chinese. I've got that strong energy of we used to be the best, we used to be the premium Asians. Correct. <laughs> you want to be a friend? No, 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 no. Like... <laughs> You want to be a friend? No, 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 no. Like, like, comment, and subscribe, subscribe this video. Video. Let's have a look who we've brought back. Hey guys, it's Key Bros. So I'm Ryan as part of the Key Bros team and I'm very happy to be here in Guangzhou to join Siming uh, to have a chat about different topics. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's get to it. Ryan, yes. why don't you talk about your journey of reconciling with mainland and how you find your voice and your perspective in this conversation. Wow, it's a very long story. Many, many years ago, that was before I was an adult, because of all the Western media indoctrination, how the education system, which we'll touch upon in Hong Kong, was run. I used to be anti-Hong Kong government. At the time, we weren't really allowed to have critical thinking in schools. My real perspective on China changed through a trip, which I went in 2018 after I graduated from high school. Uh, I went with our editor, his name is Daniel, on this very long, pretty much a month trip to different provinces in the mainland, starting from Shenzhen all the way up north to Beijing. We've gone for like Hubei, Hunan, and then also like Shanxi, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, maybe eight to ten provinces. We each stayed for like a few days. We've seen different sides of the mainland. And that's really broke my stereotypes. What's the biggest waking up lesson? that you've learned from that trip? Like as to what mainland was like? A few things. First of all, the level of development is very diverse. The culture is also very diverse. You can't just lump some mainlanders into one category. Each province has their own specialties. Even dialects can be very, very different going from one town to the other, let alone province. So I learned the importance of diversity. Secondly, I would say is, yeah, it's not as backward as I had imagined because back in the schools we're being taught that okay because of the cultural revolution yeah. because of all that uh, the mainland is very poor people are very dirty and to be fair some mainland tourists in the early 2010s they they did perform quite poorly in Hong Kong they had maybe poo on the street that did happen I'm, I, I'm not denying that happened but times have moved on people in the mainland have gotten richer yeah uh, it's gotten way more developed mm -hmm. and what I'm really surprised by is the level of technology like the high tech, the, the use of technology in 2018 really shocked me. That's even before everything has to be paid by WeChat or Alipay. That was before that time. I was really amazed by even going to like some random, you know, third tier or fourth tier village in, in like Hubei or Henan. You, you can use like a quite sophisticated technology. So that broke my stereotype of mainland such a backward, poor, dirty place. And also one interesting thing is I talked to people, maybe driving tax, uh, like the cabs, or maybe just on the streets. There are voices of uh, different voices that can be heard in the mainland, just, not just one uniform voice. You used to think that mainland is such like an authoritarian place. Yeah. You can't have any dissenting opinion by the government. Yeah. But if you just have a chat with like a random taxi driver mm -hmm. in a city, yeah. you can tell that there are room for dissent for the government. A lot of imp impression around the mainland from Hong Kong is that it is still staying back in the early 80s and yes. early 70s, right? Correct. When the mainland people are considered as uncouth and uncultured and uneducated yeah. and that impression sort of lasted until the 2000s. Sure. I remember watching a documentary on PBS on the Hong Kong youth. Okay. People who were born after 1997, sure. when after Hong Kong was handed over to China, a lot of these people, they actually have nostalgic feelings towards the colonial time. Yes, and that, which is strange. Which I felt really surprising because it seems that people are not very happy with that. So from your observation, what's the difference between opinions okay. uh, when it comes to people who were born before the colonial time and people who were born after the colonial time? Okay, I think there's a huge difference. So people who were born before 97, like my parents' generation, they've gone through both the tough times and the good times of colonialism. The good times of colonialism only happens during the last few years of the handover, around the late 1980s to the early 1990s, when uh, coincided with China opening up a lot of economic opportunities, yeah. but also because I believe it's a deliberate ploy by the Brits before they leave to instill this oh, Hong Kong as a beacon for democracy thing at the time, because for 150 years or 40 years, 
we were a colony. We couldn't vote at all for any governor. It was appointed by London. And also, we didn't have any elections until the 1980s. You know, no representation at all by universal suffrage or even just representative vote in Parliament. That did not exist until the 1980s. So my parents, who were born like in the 1960s or 50s, they experienced how the class system works before the prosperity of the 1980s. Ethnic Chinese like us couldn't enter the peak, yeah. for example. There's a law banning that. So they've gone through both the good and the bad, and they know how to judge colonialism in a fair way. Yeah. Whereas the youth, like of our generation, we have not experienced colonialism because of our education system. The teachers are mainly from the 80s and the 90s. They were born during that time. So they have, of course, a very nostalgic feel of colonialism, which they instill towards us students who are born Gen Z students or late 90s students. Normally, people like us of our age have such a positive view of colonialism, which I think is completely blown out of proportion and uh, exaggerated. And many of us actually have never lived in the West before, but they have this ideal version that oh God, thank you, let me see you in back, which translates to outsiders in the West, the moon is brighter. In the mainland, we have a saying called Song Yuan Mei Noi. Yes, uh, I've heard of that, yes. <laughs> exactly, it's the same. There's a debate in, in the mainland where we think that the younger people in Hong Kong are spoiled, sure. ungrateful. Kind of true, okay. yes. In Hong Kong, you don't go through something called a patriotic education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I remember in 2012, where the government actually proposed something like that. The activists in the yes, university, like Joshua, Wong. Joshua yes. Wong, they actually yes, opposed that. Uh -huh. yes. So I want to dive deeper into the educational experience in Hong Kong as someone who actually experienced okay. the entire primary mm -hmm. school, middle school. Yes, So <laughs> I did. tell me about how do you learn about the idea of a country, like how do you relate to this idea? Okay, now how we talk about, we were taught about a country is mainly through two subjects. I would say one is Chinese history, one is liberal studies, which they've cancelled it uh, until quite recently. Um, In 2022, right? Something like that, yeah, really yeah. quite recently. Yeah. But I went through it in junior high school at least. Mm -hmm. We were being taught about uh, how modern China was founded, Everything that started in the 1900s. Okay, okay that'll give you a bit better picture of why so many of our kids have this kind of view and are being misled. We started off talking about, okay, there was the century of humiliation. Oh, there was? There was, there was discussion of that. Okay, like we were being basically humiliated, embarrassed by the Japanese, by uh, the Americans, by, you know, the Russians. You know, we, we did t teach about What that. about the British? As well, to be fair. Oh, okay, yeah. And obviously we also covered like how the CPC was founded, 27, you know, in Zaigongshan and then go to Yinan. We did oh. learn about that, okay? Oh, okay? Also in liberal studies class, we did. However, once 1949 came, it was being taught quite selectively. For example, they were just focused on all the bad things that the CPC have done, like the famine, the Agapon, a lot of emphasis on the Cultural Revolution, like how they persecute the, the bourgeoisie, the, the upper class, Communism is bad, capitalism is good, that's what's being taught in liberal studies class. Literally? Literally. I'm not joking, that's happened in liberal studies class. Okay. Not Chinese history, but liberal studies class. As I told you, the teachers were born in the 1990s or 80s, they write the model answers for the exam. Our education system does not really foster critical thinking, contrary to popular opinion. We do not. The teacher gives you a model answer, you memorize it, you write it out on the exam, you get 10 marks. Wow. People just basically write out the teacher's perspective. Okay, so what's the example, exam question that you get when it comes okay. to like political values? Right, there's one, this is in religious studies class, very loaded. It was in 2014 during the umbrella revolution thing. The teacher basically posted a photo in the exam, right, of police beating up protesters and asking whether it's moral. So basically you're forcing yourself to like say it's not moral to, to, to gain marks in the exam. Right. Uh, that's just one example of how the, the questions are set. Mm -hmm. A liberal studies class, they talked about, I think there's one on like, was the Cultural Revolution good or, good or bad? And the model answer, I believe, was pretty much just maybe one positive and then most were like negative. They didn't talk about the other things, positive things that happened in China at the time. For example, Kong Mei Wu Tiu, like against the fighting in the Korean War mm -hmm. against uh, the US. None of that was mentioned, which happened in the same time, pretty much, as the Cultural Revolution or maybe right, right before only Cultural Revolution, and also they talked on one particular incident in 1989. They completely just focused on that, but they completely neglected at the same time there was like opening up, reform opening up, China was prosperous. They also didn't give us the backdrop. They've just focused on, okay, that happened in 1989 was bad, but they forgot to talk about 
This happened also in Yugoslavia, in the Soviet Union. There was an active force of determination in the West to undermine communist countries. Okay, that's the aim to basically dissolve them. It was really one-sided, I believe, how it was being taught in, yeah. in class. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't really give the country such a very fair depiction. I think the, the best way is to give both the good sides and the bad sides, and you just think by ourselves. But our education system, that didn't occur. We were never taught about anything to do with independence, to be fair, none of that. Yeah. In class, none of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were always emphasize the differences between Hong Kong and the mainland. Yeah. Uh, that sense of national identity was never really emphasized in high school because of how the education system works. It's played a huge factor into making us less proud to be Chinese, to say, and just focus on, oh, we're proud that we're from Hong Kong. Or Hong Kong is a very distinct identity that needs to be preserved. I could see that there's a huge big gap in terms of what kind of values are mentioned. In mainland, we learn about that the CPC founded the country and yes. the entire economic results that China went through after 1978 mm -hmm. was the hard work and the intelligent decision making from the leadership. Mm -hmm. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of positive being mentioned, okay. cultivating a sense of loyalty to sure. the country. Whereas right. in Hong Kong, it seems to me that it is through discussing how more advanced Hong Kong econ economic yes. was and through, let's say, interpretations of different historical events yes. uh, that passed down a different set of values to Hong mm -hmm. Kong youth. I think so, yeah. You, you put it quite precisely. Like When you mentioned this distance from the mainland, I was thinking about the element of class. Whenever I was thinking about what people are complaining when they're having interviews with foreign journalists and they, they, they are a bit scared of going to mainland and yes. integrating with sure. the mainland. And I was thinking, does that have anything to do with class ideologies because the primary reason that people don't want to be associated with mainland was because mainland was poor yes. and it does not represent any sort of economic opportunities. I'm not sure. saying this is the truth, but I feel like people are afraid of it. So I would assume that people who have more hostile attitudes towards the mainland are probably from the middle class because the middle class are yes. the social class that actually Correct. does value security, stability yes. and a better lifestyle through maybe going sure. through different systems. Sure. So Hong Kong society is V-shaped. What's about V-shaped? You have the upper 5 10% which control most of the wealth, to be fair. Most of these people are very pro-China because they have high-end positions in the government yeah. or maybe they have really, really close business ties with the mainland. So these people, especially the kids as well, who go to international schools, yeah. very pro-China. Bottom 5 to 10%, not to generalize, but that's true, mainly people who maybe I'm talking working really class. working working class people yeah. driving maybe lorries, buses, taxis. Okay, those people are also quite pro China because let's say during the the riots, right? If you can't drive, then you can't go to work. You have no income, so that completely disrupted their way of work. Or maybe if you're cross border trade, that affected a lot during the, the the trouble. Naturally, you tend to support the government, whereas the middle, I would say. 60%. The comfortable. Comfortable, 70 class, middle class people. By the way, I'm from middle class, okay? So uh, I know how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them tend to be quite anti government. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of grievances towards the government. Economic ones. Yes. Some of them are not mainland focused. Like political ones, I think it's just a sham. Mm -hmm. The main underlying problem is because people are really struggling to make ends meet yeah. in terms of because yeah. the housing prices in Hong Kong are just insane. Yeah. So it's just so difficult to like own a house. Nobody yeah. of my age mm -hmm. owns a house. Yeah. Nobody. We all live with our parents. Yeah. Uh, a lot of resentment has caused because of that mm -hmm. towards the government. Yeah. People just manifest it through anti-government yeah. actions of vote. Yeah. If you think about it, the Hong Kong system is not necessarily democratic in a way because no, no. Uh, you can't you don't have universal suffrage no, you can't no. elect the, the chef's the city the, the, the chief executive yes yeah it does have democratic features but yes. it's not exactly a democracy yes. so since that you can't elect who was in office it means that uh, the way you express your political will was through protest Correct. That's a and freedom of speech. Spot on, yes. Right? That you're was, right, you're right. That was, that was how people express uh, how they feel about the society. Yes. When well, you mentioned that when the middle class, where well, maybe they are not getting jobs, they're not having better jobs, uh, maybe they're seeing that their men and their counterparts are having a better life. And slowly they have to catch up with the reality that the mainlanders in some cities are doing better than they Much do. better. Much better than uh, they I have to say much better. And they yes. feel that sense of grievance. It's like, we used to be special. We used to be the better ones. Yes. And I don't know what the future holds for Hong Kong anymore. I agree. I agree. Because many people nowadays, if you notice, 
and middle class especially who stayed in Hong Kong have not immigrated abroad through BNO or whatever. Yeah. They go to Shenzhen like every weekend to shop or Guangzhou like it. It's so close. It's just one hour because of high speed rail is so close, like one yeah. hour, half an hour, 15 minutes you're in Shenzhen. And they can see the difference. Like in the mainland people have large houses, living well, things are relatively cheap, yeah. quality of life is good. Yeah. Uh, and there's this sense of mm, dai da, in Cantonese, you know, a little bit of jealousy yeah. involved. I can, I can feel that. You can feel that. I can really feel that. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's the same as like the West cannot accept China's rights. It's the same principle because many people in, in the United States or like uh, the UK or the EU, mm -hmm. they have this sense of, okay, we're the top 5% in the world. And suddenly there's this non-European country that's yeah. risen par on par. Yeah. Um, they, they can't accept that the world is not just them. Yeah. Like global have generally by one force that's yeah. the end yeah. and Hong Kong I think is a microcosm or like a reflection of that just I've got that strong energy of we used to be the best we used to be the premium Asians correct <laughs> correct but that's really true like you hit the yeah. jackpot yes the sense of superiority has crumbled like completely crumbled especially past few years let's say if you are traveling abroad and sure, sure, someone sure. asks you where are you from what do you say how do you identify yourself such an interesting question now it depends where I go yeah. So obviously I, I'm from Hong Kong. I, I'm proud to be from Hong Kong, but also I'm very proud to be Chinese. I've told that all along in my channel. These two identities not necessarily have to be the antithesis of the other. Like they, they can complement each other. Like especially I write Chinese, I speak Chinese. Cantonese is Chinese, you speak Cantonese as well. I don't see any, any difference. So that's how I identify myself. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of answering your question, yeah. what do I answer? And the, the thing that you just said off camera. <laughs> I will, I will. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, let me try to get back into the mode. In the past, I used to always stress on my Hong Kong identity more. Yeah. But recently, especially these few years, I find myself actually identifying more as Chinese. Yeah. They're, they're, they're from Hong Kong, but seriously, especially having lived abroad, in Africa especially, because yeah. in Africa, I was based in Cote d'Ivoire, Western Africa people couldn't differentiate like where, when I tell them from Hong Kong, they don't even know where it is. But when I say I'm from China, they would immediately know. In Africa, for sure, everywhere I go, I just tell them I'm from China, I'm Chinese, I get like really top class treatment. China is like helping Africa a lot, like infrastructure, I can see that with my own eyes. Um, building airports, building bridges, railways in Nigeria, like it's really transformed the continent. In the West, I have to be a bit more careful. Okay, especially when I was in the United States, for example, I would say I'm from Hong Kong first mm -hmm. because of all the political tensions. Like, do you assume that people will respect you more if you said you're from Hong Kong? Uh, this is what I find so funny because I've traveled around the US as well. I, I, this was so interesting. I went to a random town in West Virginia, like a red state, completely hillbilly. I'm the only ethnic Asian in the town, I believe, at the time. I was just visiting. Uh, I talked to this homeowner. I, asked, I told her, okay, where, where are you from? I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, and then do you know what she said? Oh, isn't that place in Thailand? <laughs> like, like they, they don't even, can't even differentiate like normal average Joe in America. It's not even Taiwan, it's yeah, like... <laughs> it's Thailand, right? Like between Hong Kong or, or China, Taiwan, Thailand, you know, it's all the same to them. Japan, for in their eyes, you're Asian. So I would say it, I'm not just proud to be Chinese. I'm also proud to be Asian. Like, I, I'm, you're proud I'm, to be Thailand. Yeah, I, I'm from Thailand, you know, like Kok Kun Kap. <laughs> But in some countries which are probably friendlier to China, like in Hungary or in Serbia, especially Serbia, people are so friendly. Like they just treat me as like brothers, you know, like they high five with me, you know, like, yeah. So it really depends on where I go. In Southeast Asia, Central Asia, I'd say I'm Chinese, no problem. Yeah. Just in the West, I have to be a bit more, bit more careful because of all the racist attacks. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, I don't see why we cannot be proud to be Chinese. And I am proud to be Chinese here on camera. A lot of criticisms around this topic saying that it is harming the transparency and the judiciary advantage of Hong Kong. What's your opinion on this? Do you support uh, NSL? I would say, given the trouble and the violence and the chaos that's happened in 2019, 2020, I have no choice but to support it because otherwise we wouldn't return back to stability, prosperity, law and order. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the reason why uh, I support it. Now, in terms of its implementation or whatever, you, you, yeah, there are arguments, valid arguments, that you know, it's, it's suppressing freedom of speech, whatever. But I have to say, every single country that I know of has national security laws. The UK has one. They recently passed in 2023, and they tried to like, prosecute people from Hong Kong mm -hmm. using their own national security law only last, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. okay? um, the US has 
dozens of national security laws, like the Patriot Act after 9-11 is a prime example. In Spain, there's national security law. Uh, otherwise, Catalan independence leaders won't be jailed for like 13 years yeah. or 10 years, yeah. okay? So every country has laws to safeguard their national security and territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with that. I, have no, I won't judge whether Americans, their national security law is good or bad, the UK one's good, it's bad. I, I, I don't really care. That, all I care is don't have double standards. If you have national security laws, then why can't we have them as well? Is it okay if you have that black flag that uh, says Gong for Hong Kong? No, that, that does come, that's off completely. That's off. Yeah, because that message is to overthrow the government. Like you're basically, oh, okay. yeah, gaming, right? Like complete revolution yeah. Yeah. to like completely dismantle the whole Hong Kong structure or, 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 or the one country two system. So if you have that flag, if you like put that on your on your car, yeah. it, that you will be arrested. Pretty much, yes. Oh, yes, okay. like after the national security law. Yeah, that's yeah. a fact. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same for like if you have a flag saying Hong Kong is Hong Kong's not part of China or like Hong Kong is independent, yeah. you will get arrested. Yeah. So let's sure. not be too biased towards and as well. If we want to empathize with people that have problems with this law, are there reasons that are like you know what? That's understandable. Yeah. That's I guess so. I, can, okay. I see where you come from. Yeah. I do because I think like the examples we've discussed just now, like certain parties have to be banned, or certain ideas kind of be espoused. Yes, you can argue that that is potentially an infringement upon freedom of speech. That I completely understand, and to some extent I actually agree with that, okay? Yeah. Because let's say if you're in the US, you want to advocate for like Texas independence, California independence is allowed, okay? Yeah. Uh, so that, that, from that argument, I can see your point of view, but my, my, uh, my point is human rights are multifaceted. This is just one human right, okay? There are multiple other human rights, uh, like social, having social order, right to eat, right to um, live, okay? People not, don't often talk about this, but you have to take these into account. In yeah. China or in Hong Kong, um, you can basically go out in the streets 3 a.m., 4 a.m. at night without any problems. Yeah. That's a right you do not have in the West, yeah. okay? If you allow so much social disorder and um, disruption, then you're basically giving more priority to one type of human rights, but neglecting or depriving you of some other human rights. So I think um, it's, it's important to maintain a balance, yeah. uh, not just freedom of speech, but also of other human rights. And if yeah. that can be achieved, uh, then that's best for Hong Kong society. China is moving up. It yeah. has a lot more influence around the world. Way more. For example, in the United Nations, like how that the votes, because China is a permanent member of the Security Council, like yeah. often it has way more say, getting way more vocal, I would say, than before. Like previously, in regards to Ukraine or maybe Israel, Palestine, China would be probably silent, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Now it starts has its own voice. It publishes plans, peace plans for Ukraine. Yeah. It publishes oh, how we should cooperate with the Arab world and also maybe like Iran, you know, Turkey to deal with the, the Middle East problem. I can see with my own eyes that mm -hmm. China is globally yeah. is rising, is stepping up the plate yeah. to help the world yeah. through the Belt and Road Initiative, yeah. uh, through these different forums. Yeah. So I think it's quite a positive change yeah. in my eyes. And the West just can't fathom that. They just can't accept that there's an alternative way to their 100 or 200 years since the Industrial Revolution of my way is the highway yeah. Um, method. Yeah, definitely. And you actually become to understand that actually uh, the old logic, the old structure of thinking that there is this hierarchy of the West at the top, China at the middle, maybe at the sure. bottom, is changing, it's completely moving, changed. it's completely 100%, changing. Yes. And that is, again, changing the way we identify with this culture as Chinese, yes. and as this culture. The adjustment that Hong Kong people have to make is to open their eyes and maybe to travel a bit more exactly. to the mainland and to see that there's a real dynamic change now happening, uh, politically speaking, and economically speaking. I guess I've, if I've asked everything I wanted to okay. ask. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Wow, so effective. Yes. So thank you for sharing your insights, Ryan. Thank you so much for inviting me <laughs> on your channel. Please do subscribe to the channel. I've watched many of her videos. We are using subscribe, comment, okay, and like this Okay, okay. okay. like <laughs> Like, like, comment, subscribe, subscribe YouTube Yay! Yes! <laughs> Job done. Job done. So effective. Yes.